Jesus, if we just can get the right view of who you are, who you are, what you've done, your power, your majesty, Jesus, that's really all we need. Because once we get a view of you, Jesus, it changes us. You can't stay the same and experience you and who you are and your power. Jesus, I pray over our services today. God, I pray over um, all of our ministries and all the areas. I pray that you will be supreme. I pray that whether in the children's building next door, Jesus, your name will be supreme in that door. Whether it's the preschool or the students' ministries, God, that the name of Jesus would reign supreme today. Because if that doesn't happen, then the Holy Spirit doesn't come, and then everything that we're doing is worthless. So Jesus, help us to humble ourselves. Help us to turn our hearts, affection, and minds' attention towards you. That you can be glorified. All these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Jason. If you don't know me, I'm the middle school pastor. And uh, Tim actually let me come back. This is, this is actually the first time ever that within the same sermon series, I get to preach two times within the same sermon series. I, I think it's just because he's out of town. Um, but... You know, I got to start the Armor series with the Belt of Truth, which was a lot of fun. It was a very fun sermon. And now we get to kind of finish the pieces of armor with the Sword of the Spirit. And next week, uh, we'll kind of finish the whole series and together. So this series has been about spiritual warfare, which can I say is an understudied topic in I would say possibly our church, but I would say many American churches, which very could be the reason why we have so many issues in American Christianity. The imperative of this series is to stand firm. That's the goal. That's what God wants us to do is to stand firm in our faith. Now, he gives us tools, which is the armor pieces, to do that. But the goal is to stand firm. And if we're not standing firm, then our enemy is going to overwhelm us. And I want to remind you that our enemy is singular. It's not a group. It's not others. It's not even people. We have one single solitary enemy, and his name is Satan. Our enemy wants to destroy us. Why? Because he can't hurt God. He hates God. He hates everything about God. He hates the fact that he's already lost to God, and he can't do a thing about it. So what does he do? He attacks those whom he loves. That's why we're in the crosshairs. That's the whole purpose of spiritual warfare, is him destroying us because it hurts God when he can destroy us. Spiritual warfare for the Christian then is the art of spiritual self-defense. Can I just say that's going to be a theme today? That's something that the Lord has been working on me. Um, self-defense is for when you cannot escape an attacker. This week as I was preparing for this sermon, I realized there's no way I can get away from him. He will relentlessly pursue me. He will relentlessly pursue my family. He will relentlessly pursue the ministry, the church, the students in the ministry. There is nowhere that I can go on this earth because this is his dominion for now where I cannot escape him. And if he can track me there, then I have to be prepared for self-defense. So God, in his wisdom, he gave us three pieces of armor at salvation, right? Those are the first three pieces. The belt of truth, which is the first one. And if you were here with me, you remember that there's actually no belt. Right, And I struggled with that. I got into the text, I'm like, there's no belt here. How am I supposed to preach about a belt when there's no belt in the Greek? And so it says to, are you ready? Do you remember it? It's gird up your loins with the truth. 
And that just leaves you with all sorts of wonderful images in your mind. All right, so, but it's to prepare yourself, gather yourself up with truth because it is the base, it is the foundation. And we receive that at salvation. When we receive the truth, who is the very embodiment, Jesus Christ, he comes through the Holy Spirit, indwells us, and now the truth is a part of us. Second, he gives us the breastplate of righteousness. He has made us new. Amen? The old things are gone. The new have come. And, you know, as much as we try to go back to the old ways, if you're a Christian, that's really not, that's really not a thing to do. That's really not even possible. Because if you're a Christian and you try to go back to the old ways, you'll be miserable. The Holy Spirit will chase after you to remind you who you are, whose you are, and where you're going to be going. Then you have uh, the last one that they give to us, and that is the shoes of the gospel. And that is simply wherever you go, wherever your footsteps is yours. I love to use the imagery when I'm, when I'm talking about the shoes of the gospel of uh, Joshua, where God says to Joshua, wherever your footsteps, I have given you. And as Christians, that's really how we should live. Whether students go into their schools, you go into your business place, your home, your neighbors, wherever your footsteps, that is the mission field that God has placed you in, and he's already given it to you. And so you're just out taking a stroll in the kingdom that God has prepared beforehand for you, that you might do good works. Then he gives us three things that we are to take up. Okay, so the first we already have. Those first three we already have, but then he gives us three that we are to take up. The first is the shield of faith, okay, and that's to protect against the attacks of the evil one. The second is the helmet of salvation, which is about changing the way you think. That's why Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed any longer to this world, to the pattern of this world, meaning literally to squeeze into a mold so that you look, think, act, behave just like the world. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That renewing of your mind, there's actually an abbreviated form of that word in the New Testament, and it's called repent. To repent is not a negative term. We always treat it as a negative term. We treat it as something that we're walking away from, but it's not just what we're walking away from, it's who we're walking to. And that's what renews our mind. And then the last piece that we're talking about today is the sword of the Spirit. That's The last step, we can't get away, there is no escape, there is no fending off the arrows, everything is a full onslaught against us. And so now we have to actually draw our sword and defend ourselves. So if you will, take out God's word, we're going to be in Ephesians 6, I'm going to kind of walk us through this, and we're going to start in verse 10, we're going to go through 18 and kind of stop there because... Tim told me I had to. So, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God." praying at all times in the Spirit, and with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So today is going to be less of a flow where I kind of like to work through. Like my, my MO is I like to take a chunk of Scripture and work my way through it and make this big, really cool thread. But he gave me like, you get sword of the Spirit, I get four words, and there's not a lot to work with that, and it says, you know, which is the Word of God. So I've got three thoughts that I just kind of want to give you today. What is the sword of spirit, and how do we effectively use it? That's my question. First, the sword is the Word of God. I didn't have to interpret that. I didn't have to give that to you. Paul gave that to you. It is the Word of God. The Word of God is powerful, 
It says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged swords, piercing to the vision of soul and spirit and joints of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is a direct reference to the truths that we find in scriptures. In scripture, they use the phrase, the word of God, to refer to one of three things. It can be the voice of God or the voice of Christ, interchangeable, It can be the gospel, which we'll see later, or it can be literally the scriptures. Now, as a side thought for all of you who are kind of pondering that, the New Testament hadn't been fully written yet. So when they're saying that, they're actually not referring to the New Testament. They're referring to the Old Testament. The Old Testament, according to Christ, had everything we needed right there, and he opens it up for his disciples. See, I agree with the idea that the Bible is the very word of God and exactly what Paul is referring to here because through Scripture is the best way to make disciples. Not just disciples, but disciple makers, followers of Jesus Christ. Let me put this into a really funny story where God taught me a lot. Um, So I'm 12 years into ministry, coming up on 13, and uh, in my first two years of ministry, I was really bad. Just being honest, like I was so inexperienced, I was so green, I was super idealistic too. And so um, right around year two, I discovered that the foundation for Christian discipleship is scripture and prayer. That's really all you need. God speaks to me through scripture, I then process scripture, I speak it back to God, who then reveals more scripture and back and forth. So I came up with this big, long sermon series called Sword in the Stone. I can see my wife grinning already because she knows what happened. Um, So I went and bought one of those like fiberglass rock water meter covers. You know what I'm talking about? That like they put out front of buildings and stuff. And then I went to Amazon and bought a real sword, cut it, put it all in, set it up on the stage. I had this awesome looking stage for this series. And the premise of it is most Christians, their sword is in the stone because they don't know the word of God. If they knew the word of God, then their sword would be ready at their side to be used. And just to put that kind of as a point, something I would always do with students, and I still do to this day, is I say, how do we know that this happens? Or how do I know that this is true? Or how do I know that God believes this or the scriptures affirm this? And they'll say, well, because the Bible says it. And then they know they're in trouble. Because my next question is, where does the Bible say that? And then the students really quickly learn to stop answering Jason's questions because I'm going to ask, like, okay, if the Bible says this, where does it say that? And so I did this big competition, and you could gain points for every verse that you memorized. And if you made it to a halfway point, which is like, I think, 7,000 points, then you became a page, which was like a knight in training. And then if you made it like 14,000 points, uh, then you became a full-fledged knight, which was like about... 50 verses total over a 12-week span. There was a guy named Adam Faulkner. I had made this big paper chart so that I could keep track of who had how many verses. I had to add on to the chart for him because he memorized over 200 verses in 12 weeks. Memorized an entire book, memorized entire chapters. It was so cool the first time he did it. He comes up and he starts quoting scripture, right? And he gets to this moment, he goes, oh, because I realized he had forgotten where he was at. All the students thought he was done. So they're all like, that guy just quoted like five verses back to back. They were so excited. And then he kept going and going. It's one of my favorite memories. So about week 10 into this process, I I kind of have been playing this whole thing up. It's like, hey, if you memorize all these verses and you reach knighthood and you get all these verses down, you get to take home a sword and we're gonna do this crazy thing. We're gonna do like uh, medieval knights and we're gonna like ride in and joust and all this crazy stuff because again, I'm a student pastor, right? And so I'm doing all this crazy stuff and you're gonna get to pull out the sword and we're gonna take pictures, we're gonna video it. It's gonna be awesome. And about like week 10, it hits me. You're gonna give a kid a weapon. (laughs) And I was like, and thus ends my ministry right here. Like, this is, my career was two years, very short, and it's gonna end in a bang, but that's it. So, like, in a panic, I have about six students who are gonna finish, and so I'm calling up parents like, hey, I'm sorry, but this was the plan, this is what it was gonna be, and yeah, your kid's gonna get a sword when he comes home. And whenever I explained it, the parents were actually all okay with it. 
That caught, yeah, right? That caught me by surprise too. I was like, oh. They were like, no, that's a great idea. And I said, so tell you what, you come, it'll be awesome. And so whenever they earn their sword, they get to pull it out and it's awesome and then immediately we're gonna give it to you, okay? And then the parent can take it home. And the parents were cool with that. A couple years later, um, I was meeting uh, with a missionary who knew the brother of one of the guys who got a sword. And he says, yeah, I was in his house the other day, and you know, he still has that sword hanging on his wall. Why? Because he learned that if you learn the word of God, then the very power of God is in your hands. You see, I feel that most Christians never experience the power of God because they don't know the word of God. If we would simply take a little bit of time, not a lot, a little bit of time to study God's word on maybe a daily, weekly basis, slowly that would accumulate over time. And what was originally just small deposits day by day, maybe five minutes here, 10 minutes here, becomes a mountain of spiritual wealth. Because the word of God is the language of God. And out of the language of God, the Holy Spirit can prompt you, can guide and direct you. But if you don't know the word of God, then it's like going to a foreign country and trying to have a conversation with them across a language barrier. But if you know the word of God, your words will drip with the very tongue of God. Your prayers will have a depth to them. Most Christians are what I call infant Christians or baby Christians, which don't get me wrong, that's wonderful. They're new believers. It's exciting to see God changing lives. But, you know, if you stay a baby Christian for too long, it kind of gets weird, right? Kind of like that 40-year-old son that still lives in your house, right? You kind of want him to mature. When you say things like, I come to church to be fed, or I like that preacher because I feel spiritually fed or he meets my spiritual needs. Don't get me wrong, like the, the pastor should shepherd his people. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't feel that way, but if that's the only place you're getting fed, what you're doing is you're starving yourself all week long. You get one little meal on Sunday and then you go on to starving yourself when a feast waits for you every day of the week. And if you don't know where to start, listen, super easy. Just go find a small group, a connect group, a D group, and all it is is about having accountability to build up one another so that you can learn the word of God. Two, the spirit of God. The sword belongs to the spirit. Did you notice that? It's called the sword of the spirit. I thought it was like the spirit empowered it or something like that, but I just when I was studying this week, I was like, oh, that's possessive. The sword is not my sword. The sword is his sword. So therefore, he gets to command it. He gets to tell me how to wield it. You know, being in a military town is very beneficial for this series. For example, to all my military veterans in the room, can you just see a hand real quick, military veterans? Okay, okay, so when you went into the service, right, you got a standard issue weapon, correct? That's what they referred to it as, right? Maybe you actually got multiples, and then you were trained in it, okay? Now, when you retired or um, were discharged, did they let you keep it? Of course not, because who owns it? Uncle Sam does. It went right back to the military, right? They issued it to you, and then you had to give it back. If it's the sword that belongs to the Holy Spirit, it's ours on loan, we're given it, we're commissioned with it, hopefully we're trained in how to use it, which is really where the first part was at. We must be trained in how to use it, but ultimately it belongs to God. So then, let's think through those implications for a little bit. If it belongs to the Spirit, then He chooses our missions. Have you ever thought of that? We don't have to choose them. To me, that is a huge load off my shoulders. Because I don't have to worry about being super holy Christian, man, everywhere I go. It's just wherever the Spirit sends me, that's where I go. If he prompts me, if he guides me, if he directs me, then that's when I should be obedient. 
If we will spend time in Scripture, we will learn the language of God. If we learn the language of God, then the Spirit of God can speak to us using his language, and we shall know what he wants us to do, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepared them beforehand for you, that you might walk in them. Let me explain with a story. When I arrived at the Baptist College of Florida, I was 19 years old, going into college. My, my plan was not to be a pastor, okay? I never wanted to be a pastor. My dad's a pastor. So the last thing I wanted to do growing up was what he did, okay? Because I saw it. I saw the insides. He would take me to hospital visits sometimes early in the morning, keep him alive as we drove to the hospital. And I didn't want to do it. But God called me, so I went. Well, I went not knowing how I would pay for the schooling, okay? I mean, I knew there was like student loans out there, but I knew that God was calling me to graduate debt-free. So I went, and I was gonna be short a chunk. The very first day I'm on campus, what do I do? I move in the dorm, because that's smart. Let's go ahead and unpack everything before you know how you're gonna pay for it. I move into the dorm, And then I go down to the education department because I'm looking for a job and I heard that there might be an on-campus job there. Now listen, if you're a new kid on the block, you generally don't get the job. Generally other kids who have been there for longer, who the, the professors know and have a relationship with, they get the job. They offered me two. That never happens. But I'm still gonna be a little short so I go to the business office, and, I, and I'm talking to the registrar, or sorry, the business office person, and I am asking, okay, how am I going to be short? What's, what's happening? And they say, you're still about $500 short a semester, which now for any of you who are paying for your kids' tuition, you're like, let's do it, $500 a semester. That sounds great, right? But for me, poor college kid who's paying for my own tuition, I'm just like, where am I going to come up with $500? I leave the business office, I'm walking across the quad, head to the student union, and I see Dr. Malone. Dr. Malone walks right up to me and he says, Jason, what's wrong? First, I didn't know that Dr. Malone knew my name. Second, I didn't know that I looked visibly upset. So I kind of told him like, well, I'm trying to get you know, all the finances together, just got out of the financial office and I'm gonna be short a little bit. And that's all I said. I said, I'm gonna be a little short. He says, hang on a minute. Walks into the office, a minute later walks back out. He says, how does a $500 ministerial scholarship a semester? I was like, okay. (laughs) So I walked back in to the business office and I was super embarrassed because I was crying everywhere just like I am now thinking about it. But it gets better. The scholarship that I was awarded was the Lloyd C. I'm going to do this. It was the Lloyd C. and Eva May Stanland scholarship. My great grandparents, before my dad was born, put in a scholarship, and it was mine. Now, many of you have stories like that. Many of you have experienced God in ways that make you emotional. I don't like being emotional. How did it happen? The Spirit prompted you. You obeyed. And you got to saw God, you got to see God move in an amazing way. For those of you who have no stories, I'm just being honest. Maybe because you didn't obey the prompting. All right, let's get on to some cool stuff. All right, third, let's talk about the defense of God and what he's trying to accomplish. The word for the sword here is makara. That's the Greek word. In biblical Greek, makara could mean multiple swords. So it's kind of like a generic word for sword, but it was also a word for a specific sword. 
It could, it could mean four different swords. It could mean the Spatha, the Gladius, the Romphea, and the Macara. Those are the four that it could be referring to. However, I believe that Paul was specifically referring to the Macara, and I'm gonna explain why. So I've got some pictures, you ready? Yay, all right, so here we go. First picture is of the Spatha and the Gladius. Okay, so the Gladius is on the right, short, simple, and the Spatha is on the left. The Spatha is a variation of the Gladius on the right. Now, we know it wasn't the Spatha because in Roman metallurgy, they didn't figure out how to make a long sword until about the second to third century. So we know it wasn't that one, even though later in history they would use Macara to refer to generic sword, it wasn't that one. It could have been the Gladius because the Gladius, which is a Latin term, has no Greek equivalent. So, this is how they would describe the gladius. It was a double-edged makara, just like Hebrews 4.12, right? The word of God is sharper than any double-edged makara. That's that word right there. So, it could have been that. That's the, that's the second most likely option. The third option is the romphea, which is up there. There it is. All right, so long slender, sometimes it was single-edged, sometimes it was double-edged, and it was for one purpose, and generally it was carried by the cavalry, and it was for thrusting. It was a piercing instrument. Sometimes they would put that even on the end of a spear, and so they could change it between hand-to-hand -hand or on a spear, and they could then throw it like a javelin. So it's not the Romphea, though, because here's why. John referred to the Romphea six times in the book of Revelation because there's an actual Greek word, Romphea. And he describes it each time as slashing, piercing, thrusting, as an un, as a offensive weapon. Furthermore, every time the Romphea comes into play in the book of Revelation, it's proceeding from the mouth of Christ. And every word pierces. And that's why he chose that specific word, Romphea. So that then leaves us with our fourth one, which is the Macara. Now, uh, I'm a middle school pastor, and I thought, <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, wow. They had, I didn't know the music was coming. Okay, so that, that caught me off guard. All right, so this is a Macara. This is actually a long Macara. It's about 16 inches. I bought it from Bass Pro Shop. Uh, it is not super fancy or anything like that, but I'm like, bro, if you're gonna buy a stage prop to preach, you buy it when you're preaching on a sword, right? Because now every single middle school and high school boy is like, sword, <laughs> right? And they're all totally glued into everything I'm saying right now. So this is a Macara, and most of them would have been shorter, about 14 to maybe 12 inches because again, they used iron, they didn't have steel, so it wasn't quite as long. Notice, I'm doing this right now because there's no edge. There's only one edge on this thing. It's short, it's easily concealed. Um, when Peter cuts off the ear of a guy named Malchus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was carrying a Macara. It's very short, very compact, easily hidden in the robes, is how the Romans would describe it. It wasn't for stabbing, it was for cutting. It's a predecessor to what we now know as the machete. Make sense? Why did I just pull this all out and explain this? First, because it's super cool, right? <laughs> I mean, if you get to walk up on stage with a sword, that's pretty awesome. My wife said on the way up this morning, she's like, don't cut yourself on stage, <laughs> right? But notice how short it is. This is not an attack weapon, it's a defense weapon. You know, for the longest time, every time I studied this uh, armor or heard someone preach on it, it was always, you know that the sword is the only offensive weapon of the six pieces of armor. Yeah, maybe if you're talking about the gladius, at which you can make an argument for that, and I'm not saying that I'm 100% right, but according to my study, I think it's a Macara. In other words, at no point are you to use the word of God as an attack weapon. Let me give you an example. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. 
And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus used scripture to defend himself. It's the difference between getting a snub-nosed revolver and a rifle. One is designed for long-distance attack shots. The other one is, I can't get away, I can't escape, I can't get away from my attacker, I have no option left. So, let's go into then the implications that, of that. The Word of God is equated to the gospel in Scripture. The gospel is offensive, okay, can we agree? Because when you hear the gospel, you realize that you are broken, that you are in need of a savior, and that there's nothing you can do to change your sin, all right? You need Christ to pay that ransom. So the gospel is offensive. Matthew 10, 34, Jesus says it this way, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword, a makara. Jesus knew that the gospel was offensive and that many people would reject it. Therefore, if the gospel's already offensive, don't add your own offense to it. This is a defense weapon. It's not an attack weapon. And it's not even an attack weapon against Satan, who is the enemy, who is the target. It is a defense weapon. See, so many times Christians get off target, and we begin to use the word of God as a bludgeon attack weapon against other people thinking that if we debate them well enough using scripture, if we post enough tweets using scripture, somehow they're gonna change their mind because they saw a 140-character argument. Instead, we should treat this much more like Jesus did, self-defense against the enemy. Because God has not called us to attack people, God has called us to rescue them. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And it is now our job to go and find these people. Finally, I want to leave you with a thought. This is actually not a very sharp blade um, for good reason. Uh, but if you were to look at this through a microscope and look at a dull blade, you'll see why it's dull. It can either have nicks, which it already does, and it's like brand new. Um, it could have a roll, which is called a rail, where it's been rolled over, or it could have a weave in it. And that's the predominant ways that you end up with a dull blade. So when you sharpen the blade, you push the blade at a specific angle, specific to the blade, and what you're doing is you're realigning the edge. So I've got an image to show you real quick to kind of help you see that. So on... The left, I want to say, is the sharp blade. You can see it real clear. And on the right, there's a small roll. There's a small roll. Prayer out of verse 18 is how you sharpen the edge. Why? Because it's in all circumstances, pray in the what? Spirit. Now that you've been given the sword of the Spirit, you're to pray in the Spirit. Because that's how you stay effective. That's how you stay moving forward. If you're using a dull sword, you're not going to accomplish much. So you have to keep it sharp. So then, let's put this all together, and I'll be done. Start by learning the Word of God. If you're wanting to learn how to be an effective Christian, start by learning the Word of God. That is the wellspring for which the Holy Spirit has to draw out of you. Because times of trial and difficulty are going to come, and when they come, they squeeze you, and just like a sponge, whatever's in there comes out. And if you have the Word of God deep in you, that's what's going to come out. Second, seek the Spirit through prayer. Constant, every day. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to take a lot. You can actually sharpen a blade with just very few passes. But what it's doing is realigning your life to Christ. It's not you trying to get something out of God, which is what we all do, let's just be fair. It's you saying, God, help me to line up with you and your will. Finally, 
be prepared to defend yourself. Because 2 Timothy 3.12, if anyone desires to live a godly life, he will be persecuted. Spiritual warfare will come if you're doing what God has called you to do. Because our enemy will try to stop you. He's going to do it. So be prepared in season, out of season. 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. If we live the godly life, we're going to face these spiritual warfare challenges. If we will live according to Scripture, knowing Scripture, having the well of Scripture, seeking the Spirit so that our blade is aligned in everything that we do, following his prompting, when he says go, we go, and then we're always prepared, we're going to have an effective, sharp sword. Too many times God calls us and we don't hear him. Too many times God calls us and we're not prepared. Wouldn't it be wonderful if just as a church we said, here am I, Lord. I'm prepared. Send me. Whether it's to my neighbors, to my coworkers, to someone around the world, or someone in a different state. Here am I, Lord. Send me. If you're here and you're not a Christian, and this kind of seems a little foreign to you. That's okay. That's, that's kind of normal. <laughs> um, Jesus paid the ransom so that you can be free. And in just a moment, we're going to start some music. We're going to have some encouragers down here to meet with you. If you would like to give your life to Jesus today, I would encourage you to come down and find us. Now, if you're a Christian, I just have a very simple invitation for you. Get in God's word and get on your knees. Find a brother or sister to do it with you. Do it as a family. Do it as a small group. Whatever works. Because it's in those moments that God is going to prepare you, that God is going to align you, that God is going to draw up from the wealth that the word is in our lives to accomplish great and wonderful things. Let's pray. Jesus, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Thank you that we don't have to worry about a battle that has to be fought because, Jesus, you've already won it. The battle is done. It's over. There is no enemy even for us to defeat because he's defeated and he knows it. Jesus, help us simply to be more than conquerors, to walk out and trust and depend on you, to know what you're doing. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You come if you need to see a pastor or speak or pray with someone.